This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. We often hear about serial entrepreneurs who are constantly starting up new businesses, then moving on to start another one. Well, today we're speaking with someone who, to me, seems like a serial missionary. You may remember Jim Canelon from his overnight TV show, Talk To Me. He was also part of the Canadian television ministry, 100 Huntley Street. Now that may seem like a full resume, but that's just the window dressing. Jim has a track record of just following the voice of God. No need for a transition. When God says go, Jim and his wife pack it up and they go. I remember you from back in the, the days of 100 Huntley Street. Well, yeah, I, I hosted Huntley, I co-hosted Huntley for eight years, the first crack, and then they brought me back to help them through a little bit of a crisis for another three years. Yeah. So, yeah, I spent about 11 or 12 years with Huntley Street, and then I did I did a show out of uh, Toronto that was uh, seen only in, in, in the States, including Ohio, but you probably didn't see it because it was on in the middle of the night. It was called Talk To Me. I did 3 a.m. to live uh, to 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. live. Yeah. yeah, I want to I want to talk about that show here in a little bit, but uh, let, let's let's get started with uh, with where you where you first came to Christ. And, and I mean, uh, a ministry of was I right? Fifty two years. Yeah, 52 years. That, that yeah, started at some point where God put that call in your life. How'd that start out? Well, you know, I started the ministry when I was three. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I come from um, a ministry family. Um, uh, I'm third generation Catalan um, in, in the ministry. Wow. Uh, it goes right back to 1913. And uh, we've had... The problem with Candelons is you can't interrupt us. We, we, we've, we've had an uninterrupted run of ministers now since 1913. <laughs> Been and, preaching uh, a long time. That's right. A lot of preachers, you know, church planters, missionaries, evangelists. Uh, my father, my grandfather, my great uncles, my great grandfather uh, were all ministers of the gospel. And so uh, I just kind of, um, you know, was uh, raised in that atmosphere. And I had a very strong encounter with the Lord at a uh, Christian camp when I was five years of age. It was probably oh. the most powerful spiritual experience of my life. At, fi at five years old? Yeah, how, five how does, years old. How does the, how does the five-year-old uh, uh, process all that mentally and then spiritually? I mean, what takes over, the spiritual or the mental? How do you, you process that as well, you, five? You, you, know, you haven't really developed your critical or rational mm -hmm. faculties at that point in time. And I didn't have a, you know, a history of a lot of sinning. I hadn't been to prison, hadn't been <laughs> sleeping around. I, I wasn't drunk or, you know, or, or a drug addict, but I, I was in a children's meeting and the, uh, the gal leading the uh, children's service was uh, walking us through uh, kind of a child-sized version of one section of John uh, Bunyan's um, Pilgrim's Progress. Mm -hmm. And as I sat there, I, I felt suddenly this powerful sense of my, uh, my need to uh, commit my life to Christ. Uh, it, it was overwhelming, and when she finished, the kids all broke out in the sunshine to play, and I, I sat rooted to my seat. I couldn't move, and uh, she was sensitive enough to uh, say, hey, Jimmy, uh, can I pray with you? And she prayed with me, and then I prayed, and as I prayed, I, I wept like I never wept in my life before. I, you know, as a five-year-old, you, you, you weep because you're hurt. Mm -hmm. I, I was weeping for joy. Uh, I had a sense of the presence of the Lord that was just overwhelming, and... Uh, uh, it was really that point where, uh, if you will, my life's course was set. Mm -hmm. and, and going on from there, I mean, uh, getting into your first area of ministry, what was that like? Well, you know, it was a natural in the sense that uh, that's what my family did. Mm -hmm. You know, as some people have irreverently referred to it as the family business. But, um, you know, I had a sense when I was 12, the Lord was calling me to the ministry. Uh, when I was uh, 16, uh, it was very clear to me that that's the direction I was taking. And so when I got to college age, I, I, you know, I went to seminary and uh, studied theology and prepared for the ministry and launched you know, when I was 22. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big things, that I, as I was reading uh, some of your history there, is starting a church in Jerusalem of all places. How did that come about? Well, that's, that's an interesting story. You know, it's, it's a fascinating story. It's very entertaining. It takes me about an hour to tell it. <laughs> But uh, just the Reader's Digest condensed version, um, through an interesting sequence of events, the um, officials from the Israeli government invited me to plant a church in Jerusalem in 1981. And um, that was, and that's a good thing I was sitting down. With that's a miracle. 
<laughs> yeah, when I was given the offer, I mean, I, I this is something I never could have imagined, something I couldn't have prayed about. It, it was just one of those things that just came out of the blue. It was definitely from the Lord. And um, I said, yes, of course, I just built a brand new church in North Toronto. I had 800 people attending. I had a young family. Uh, no reason really to want to leave the situation here. But, you know, this is an offer I couldn't refuse. I mean, how do you say no to the Israeli government saying, would you plant a church in Jerusalem? And so I did. And uh, you can Google King of Kings Jerusalem and see how it's mm -hmm. doing. It's, uh, it's a great church with uh, over 12 congregations, huge social justice ministry, a big Bible college, uh, and, a, and, a, and a major international footprint. Uh, it was uh, a very unique experience. Yeah, what were you doing in, in Israel at the time when they called you? What was the work that you were about at that, at that point well, in time? I, I, had, I had gone, I had, I had started a program called Kibbutz Shalom. In fact, I was in the process of starting this program where I brought young North American adults over to live and work as volunteers on Kibbutzim in Israel. And it, that gave me the entree, if you will, for these governmental mm -hmm. meetings. And uh, it was in the context of setting that up and getting their permission that they obviously had done their homework. They were at a point in their history where they needed some friends. And uh, they knew that I represented, you know, about 1,200 Canadian churches that were very pro uh, I guess it was a combination of mm -hmm. events, but the Lord was behind it. And they, um, they said, would you please uh, consider this, as well as doing this Kibbutz Shalom program. So yeah. that's exactly what happened. That, that's, that is amazing. Uh, you, you spent, uh, with that church itself, you were there, what, about seven, eight years with King I was of Kings? Seven years. Mm -hmm. I was seven years. I, I've had a lot of, you know, pastors ask me why in the world I ever left. Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. you that just now. <laughs> why, why would you leave that? Yeah, well, most pastors would give their eye teeth to preach once sure. in Jerusalem, let alone do it every week. I had a real profound sense the Lord was calling me to, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a trailblazer. I, I'm more of a pioneer than I am anything else. Mm-hmm. I just sense the Lord wanted me to establish the thing, uh, get the DNA right, uh, train people, and work myself out of a job. And that's what I did, and it only took seven years. I was prepared to do it for the rest of my life, but in seven years I knew that uh, it was time to transition to the people I trained, and that's exactly what happened. So you, you, you moved back to, to Toronto, is that from... from was your uh, old church still there? Were you moving back well, to something, or were you moving back to, I've got to plant something new? No, you know, uh, four times in my life, Bob, I have left something that I've established and gone back to, to nothing without knowing what was next. Uh, that's sort of my wheelhouse. <laughs> And uh, what, what is, I, just time know, out. What, what is your what does your wife think about that when you're moving the family all over the world and you say, ah, we're going back to nothing, but I'm sure God's going to provide something. Well, you know, if I weren't married to Kathy, I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> um, she she she's a missionary's kid. Uh, she grew up as an international person. OK, uh, she has a profound ministry background uh, like me, several generations and um, has full regard and respect for the leading of the Lord. And, and so she always encouraged me and said, sure, let's take the risk, let's take the chance. And you know, I mean, you got little kids, you, sure. you don't have any, you don't have any uh, fixed income, you don't have any you know, established thing you're going back to. But my sense has always been that um, there's a huge horizon awaiting those who are prepared to uh, take a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. And God's faithful in that. And, and at the same time, he knows that you're faithful in, in, in being faithful to him. We want, we want to get back and talk about some more of, these, uh, some more of the ministries you've been involved in, especially one in, in Africa. Uh, but we're going to take a break right now. We'll be right back. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint.
We are back with Jim Cantillon and talking about a lot of the ministries in over, over a half a century, Jim, that you've been involved in, that God has been faithful to you and your, your wife, Kathy, and, and leading you in this ministers. You had mentioned earlier a show that you'd, you'd done that was aired in the United States, I think it came out of Chicago, called Talk to Me, and it aired during the night. And you, you had mentioned uh, that this is probably one of the most rewarding things that you'd ever done. And, uh, why is that? Well, first of all, I was the only thing that was live on television in the middle of the night in America. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, I discovered to my amazement uh, how many people are up in the middle of the night. You know, you got shift mm -hmm. workers, you got insomniacs, you got um, people who just are night people. Uh, you, you have you have prisoners, you have people in hospitals, you have people in uh, um, um, kind of. Uh, downtown rescue situations mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, it was it was open line I see I started out in broadcasting years ago doing open line radio and so I did open line radio basically on television out of Chicago and um, uh, Bell Telephone used to send me you know the bill for the 1-800 number every every uh, month and uh, they would they would include the cost of all of the completed calls, but they'd also give me a record of all the people who tried to call and couldn't get through because it was busy, and it was over a hundred thousand calls a month. Oh, I wow. mean, I, I was just I was just blown away by that. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, when people are talking to you in the middle of the night, um, there's no there's no artificiality. Uh, there's there's no sort of uh, barrier. They're they're just basically transparent. Uh, maybe because nighttime has a way of making uh, intimacy more palatable. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. But um, we talked about everything with sex to politics, uh, but with a with a biblical perspective. And uh, I, man, I, I had some of the most amazing conversations. I, uh, you know, I, everything from, well, well, for instance, when the Oklahoma bombing happened. I got a call from the gal who was in charge of setting up the memorial service the next morning with President Clinton, and wow. she said to me, "She said to me, hey Jim, maybe you'd like to know the order of service." I said, "Yes," <laughs> and so we scooped the order of service the night before it happened. Um, I I had um, I, I would do a show every year on uh, children who were uh, lost, um, and I would often get calls from kids themselves who were in a in a retreat center somewhere, or they were in some kind of a shelter somewhere, or whatever, and they would say, that's me, because I, I would show pictures of these kids, and oh, I, I, I do shows on abortion, and uh, I, I'd say, look, I'm not here to judge anybody, I just want to know, you know, you've had an abortion, tell me about it, and I, I would spend an hour and a half listening to women weeping, and occasionally a man or two who said, the regret of my life is that I forced my girlfriend to have an abortion, and so I didn't have to make any judgments. Mm -hmm. uh, the people basically just said, this is the reality and I hate it. Uh, you know, and so th these kinds of transparencies uh, gave the program a, a cutting edge. And I, I'd still love to do it, except it was killing me. I mean, five, five, years, five years of being up all night and then doing a daily television program as well. It's a wonder I survived. Yeah, that, that I was going to ask you about. You're, you're doing this throughout the night, and, and some of the people here remember that show coming out of Chicago through the night, and then still doing a job during the day. Uh, it, it had to be yeah. it had to be taxed. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, you know, I was I was just back from Israel, and I was still pretty young. And you can you know you do some pretty stupid things. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you ever feel like like you're like a hap, you know kind of like a hyperactive child? I just gotta I've got this ministry going. I gotta go start another one. God's calling me to something else. That the energy level had to be up here someplace. Yeah, well, you know, I've, I've had people ask me if I'm suffering from ADD. <laughs> I said, no, no I, I, my, my son, I'm, I'm not even a workaholic. I, I just am really excited about the call of the Lord oh, and the huge horizons that are out there for people who are prepared to take a leap of faith. And, and I, 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 I love living on the edge. I mean, that's why I ride a motorcycle. That's why Kathy rides a motorcycle. We, we just, you know, we like edgy stuff. And, uh, uh, the Lord has used that in our lives, I think, to a good end. Yeah, that, I mean, continually, some people might ask you when you're going to retire, but he continually calls you to, to enter into more things. It seems like there was a, yeah. a, a call in your life uh, to, to begin to minister to orphans yeah. and widows in Africa. Now, you hadn't, had you been to Africa at that point? 
I, I had been a few times. When, mm -hmm. when I was pastoring in Jerusalem, I, I used to get um, a lot of calls from all over the world to come and do conferences and conventions. Most of them I wouldn't go, but uh, the African ones I did go to. And so I, I had a bit of a track record in Africa doing major uh, conferences. And so I was, at this point in time, I had left television for a period and I was pastoring uh, a, a church in Vancouver, British Columbia. And it was while I was there, the Lord really laid on me uh, the call to care for orphans and widows who'd been impacted by HIV and AIDS. And um, so, you know, I did it again. I, I resigned my big church and for eight months, Kathy and I lived out of suitcases and, you know, um, People said, so what are you going to do? I said, I have no idea. I just know the Lord's called me to care for orphans and widows in Africa. And uh, we just started with what we had, which was nothing. And uh, now, 21 years later, you know, we're overseeing a, a massive uh, involvement in uh, Malawi, in uh, uh, Zambia, South Africa, and um, Chennai, India. And the ministry is called WOW. It's uh, Widows... Orphans, working, working, widows. working with orphans and widows. Now that's yeah. that's headquartered out of out of Atlanta. Is that? That's yeah. right. Uh, yeah, we have we have a, um, our American headquarters is in Atlanta. Although we were incorporated in Arizona, but uh, we work out of Atlanta. And then uh, for the Canadian operation, we work out of Toronto. So, are you still involved uh, day to day in the in the management of the ministry itself? Well, you know, I, I'm not a manager. You know, you, you can't be a trailblazer and a manager at the same time. If I, if I was managing my ministry, I'd be in prison. So, what, so, so I, I have people working with me who are really good managers. But, yeah, I'm the visionary. I'm the guy who, you know, has the final uh, veto if necessary. And uh, by God's grace, you know, with really, really, really good people, especially on the Africa side, uh, we're doing really well. Well, even there, even within WOW, W-O-W, -W, God has, has called you to refocus that to where you guys are now working as a kind of an in-home ministry to, to people that you know are dying, more of a Mother Teresa type ministry. That's right. In fact, the, the, the word the Lord gave me when I established WOW 21 years ago was every church of Mother Teresa. And she, you know, in her humble way, ministered to the dying in the streets of Calcutta, India. And... So, I, you know, I started WOW, and um, uh, I think unintentionally, I, I found my, you know, there's this thing called mission creep. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many good things you could be doing, and, and, and I, I wasn't smart enough to, to say no to some of these things. And before I knew it, I was overseeing a kind of a mini world vision, all, all good stuff. But the, the original call the Lord had placed on me was to care for the dying. And so a few years ago, we, we repurposed and revisioned uh, WOW, and uh, our singular focus is what we call home-based care. We, we go into these, mainly these little mud hut rondobbles with uh, grass roofs. There's always someone, a rack of bones lying there on the, gr on the ground, uh, so sick they can't even lift their head off the ground, uh, maybe 35, 40-year-old uh, widows mainly who look like they're 75 or 80. Um, bed sores, dysentery, um, oral thrush, throwing up, uh, huge wow. temperatures. And um, we, through local church volunteers, we meet their basic needs as they're dying. And we make sure that their orphan children are cared for. Uh, and we also, and you know, this is not exploitive. This is just simply, a, it, it, it's um, organic. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, these precious people, if they're not already followers of Jesus, they want to know why our volunteers are doing what they're doing. And the answer is, well, we're doing it because God loves you and because Jesus has called us to care for you. And uh, so the question always is, well, so how do I get to know this guy, this Jesus? Yeah. And, and so usually before these people die, you know, they're, they're coming to the Lord. And I, I've been with some of them who are just a day or two from death. Uh, and they'll, they'll be singing in their own language a praise wow. to the Lord, you know, or praying a beautiful prayer to the Lord. And it's absolutely humbling. I, I figure I need to get saved all over again. Uh, I, I feel like I'm, you know, the unwashed outsider. I, I really do. It, it, it's so humbling to see Jesus present with someone who's dying. And I'm feeling like, a, you know, a hard-bitten outsider. But by God's grace, you know, uh, we're seeing some good stuff. In a moment, we'll continue Jim's story of the many lives he's touched just because he says yes to when God says go. Well, right now you may feel like life's at a dead end. And being able to surrender to your life to Christ like Jim has and being flexible to God's voice really can bring true satisfaction in your life. 
I encourage you to check out Jim's website and his program for more information. Not only can you watch Viewpoint each week, but you can also listen to it on demand as a podcast. You can go to WTLW.com and under videos, click Viewpoint, and you'll see the selection of interviews. You can also subscribe by searching for Viewpoint with Bob Placey on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And remember to share the podcast with your friends. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. I'm back with Jim Canelon and we're talking, we've been talking about all the ministry you've been involved in over these years, very vast. But the big thing is your heart is to share Jesus Christ with people who don't know who he is. That's right. Uh, and often people don't know who Jesus is because we, we misrepresent him. Yeah, what, what is the biggest misrepresentation you think that we, we, we bring to the world when we're trying to represent Christ? What, what, are the, what does the world see in our representation of Christ? Uh, they, they see they see a, a kind of a, a mean-spirited Jesus who basically dislikes everybody unless they're uh, mainstream evangelical. No, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, <laughs> that's basically it. We, you know, we a lot of a lot of us unfortunately present Jesus as um, a moralist, you know, who's looking to condemn people. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we're very quick to quote John three and sixteen. Uh, we're not so quick to jump to quote John three and seventeen. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. Our role is not to condemn. Unfortunately, the Jesus a lot of us present to the world is a condemning Jesus. And uh, that, that sets us off the wrong foot immediately. And then sometimes we uh, ally Jesus with uh, religious nationalism. And uh, we, you know, we, we, we blend our, our view of the world and our view of democratic values and capitalism and so on into a kind of a a Jesus package, and we've, you know, it's just pure ignorance. I mean, you, you, you go to most of the world where there aren't democratic models, where there isn't a capitalistic uh, uh, economic philosophy, where people are living on less than a dollar a day, and if, if that's the kind of Jesus you're representing, then you, 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 yeah, you're you missed it. You're, you're, yeah. You know, you, you have nothing to say to these people if that's the kind of Jesus you represent. So what, what, do, you, what, do, you, what do you deliver to them? I and mean, what, what is the, the, the essence of, of why people need Jesus? People need Jesus for two reasons. One is because the Lord's created us to be righteous. He's also created us to be just. Uh, in the Hebrew language, uh, there's one word that's used often for both. When it refers to fulfillment of the vertical relationship with God, it's called righteousness. When it refers to the horizontal relationship with neighbor, it's called justice. Uh, this is the way of the Lord. Read Genesis 18 and, and read for yourself the way of the Lord as the Lord represents himself to Abraham. The way of the Lord to seek righteousness and justice. He's not calling us to be religious zealots. Mm -hmm. He's calling us to walk with the Lord humbly and to love our neighbor totally. And that's basically it. Yeah. And people, people, when they when they hear the truth of that, say they are are in a third world country. When they hear the truth of that and hear that, that God does love them, I mean, I don't think a lot of people have a, a sense of who God is, and if I just believe in God, that's enough. But when they see that He's come in the flesh, what does that do to their heart? Well, it, it, if, well, it's it's a bit of a revelation to many, but let's not lose something here. Jesus said, "Nobody comes except the Father drawing." 
Anybody who comes to Jesus comes because God the Holy Spirit has been drawing them probably for years. And, and the conversation you're having with that person is the culmination of a long-term mm -hmm. process where the Holy Spirit's been working in their life. And one has to recognize when in a conversation with someone about Jesus that you're partnering with the Holy Spirit at that point, point in time. And you got to be really, really humble and really, really sensitive to Spirit because uh, a lifetime can pivot on that moment. But ultimately, it's not my responsibility to lead anybody to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. My responsibility is just to be useful to Him in the process. Mm -hmm. To be that vessel. Well, Jim, how, how can people really, I mean, ones that are watching now, how can they find out more? How can they reach you? How can they find out more about WOW? Uh, how can they well, see your program? Well, wowmission.com is, is, the, is the website, wowmission.com, www.mission.com. But uh, on the... Um, uh, on the uh, Religious Broadcasters Network in the U.S., uh, I think it's 7 o'clock on Sunday nights, you can watch Jim Candle on Today. You can also log on to jimcandleontoday.com and watch it on the Internet. Uh, maybe, you know, if I'm really nice, even your stations might carry me someday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure but, they will. So it's, it's just, you know, we're just out there. And, mm -hmm. and I know the Internet is really the future. So we're there, and we're on YouTube, and, um, you know, Jim Canlon today, just check it out. Well, I'm glad Jim Canlon was with us today. I appreciate that. Jim, it's, it's been great to meet you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Just a reminder, Jim Canlon's website, wildmissionusa.com, is packed with great videos and information to help strengthen your faith. Hello, friends, we're right into... And if you like what you're hearing, make sure you follow us on YouTube as well as our podcast. The Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast is available on all podcast platforms and all of our interviews are available for you to listen to on demand. On the next Viewpoint with Bob Placey. John Ravel is a pastor and author, but his passion is ministering to first responders in his hometown in Southwest Connecticut. And the police chief, who is a, a salty old uh, crusty veteran cop, uh, started in New York City. And their language uh, up here is not quite like the Bible though. Uh, but uh, he said, you're the, you're the first chaplain 35 years of police work. You're the first chaplain I know that gives a blank. And I said, well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And he said, unfortunately, that's the way it is. So I just, I care. Uh, and so the Lord's preparation in being a pastor has served me incredibly well in caring for hurting people. That's next week on Viewpoint. The purpose of our program is to present a deep discussion about faith and how the Bible relates to our lives. If you enjoy the program, please support it with a monthly financial gift so we can continue to reach the world with the good news. Thanks for joining me. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.